and welcome to my new video, in which Charlotte's lovely AI voice introduces you to a workflow I've put together. Ever since I first saw them, I thought those images where something seems to be stepping out of the frame were really cool. Later, I found out that this effect was given the French name Trompe l'oeil. Translated, it means deceive the eye. And I wondered whether this could somehow be realized in Comfy UI. You can now see the result of the experiments in this video. As you can see, the workflow is a bit complex. There are five stages in total. The complexity, of course, has the benefit of giving us a lot of flexibility with what we can achieve. This out of frame effect is just one example. I'm sure you can create similar images through clever prompting, but my goal when using Comfy UI is to have as much control as possible over the individual elements of the image. Simply because I think image generating AIs are a fantastic tool for bringing my own ideas to life. And I usually have more ideas than hours in the day. But I digress. Let's dive into the setup. Stage one. For the first stage, we only need a basic SDXL workflow, which we'll use to generate a few suitable frames. The power of the lightning models helps to cut down on working time, and the results from the Juggernaut Lightning or RealVis XL Lightning models are quite impressive. The prompt that works best for me is the one you see here. It already points us in the right direction. What's crucial here is to generate the images at the right resolution. For Juggernaut and RealVis XL Lightning, 1216 832 pixels works reliably. After a test run, we can also increase the batch size a little. We'll want to have some variety. Additionally, we can start enhancing the prompt with some attributes to make the frames more interesting, such as adding materials, altering the texture of the frames, and adjusting the representation through artistic styles although we'll revisit that in stage three. For some reason, Real V's XL Lightning seems to have a strong preference for the cyberpunk style. It influences the composition in a way no other style does. I get it. I share the model's enthusiasm for cyberpunk. I've tried at least 20 different styles, but only cyberpunk has such a distinct impact. The people who trained the model clearly had specific ideas in mind for its application. Don't forget to vary the orientation of the frames, as this will allow us to design the scenarios differently and have the subject step out of the frame in various ways. Now that we've got enough frames, it's time to move on to stage two. Stage two. Here, we need the nodes to create IP adapter embeddings. While there are now several other good methods and nodes that allow for style and composition transfer, I personally like working with embeds simply because they're reliable. Over time, you can easily build up a small library of different styles or specific compositions. They're essentially little multi-tools, which is a concept I really like, especially since they open up so many possibilities with minimal effort.
after we click Q Prompt, the saved embeddings will land in the output folder. To use them later, we just need to move them to the input folder. It's worth creating a dedicated embeds folder within the input directory to keep things organized. That's it for stage two. Let's move on to stage three. In addition to the usual nodes, we'll be adding a few extras here. These will allow us to stylistically modify the frames we generated earlier to our liking. To see this in action, we'll need the IP adapter unified loader, two IP adapter embeds nodes, two load image as mask nodes, and the IP adapter load embeds node. Between the checkpoint and the unified loader, it's usually a good idea to include a perturbed attention guidance node, which has a positive impact on image quality, even with the low-step lightning models. Additionally, a control net gives us the control we need over the frame design. I typically use the realistic line art preprocessor. Once again, we need to ensure that we set the correct resolution in the empty latent image node, or we'll get some odd results. Once we've placed or uploaded our frames, it's time to mask the areas where we want to apply different appearances. At this point, it might be helpful to say a few words about using the mask tool. We can adjust the thickness of the mask tool using the mouse wheel or directly with the slider. The left mouse button applies the mask and the right mouse button removes it. Under pointer type, we can select a circle or rectangle. Together with the control key and the left mouse button, we can move the image in any direction. Holding shift and the left mouse button lets us zoom in and out by moving the mouse down or up. The same can be achieved by holding control and using the mouse wheel. Personally, I almost always use the latter method to zoom into an image section. For the first application of the embeds, we need to mask the inside of the frame. If we're dealing with a dark background, there's a helpful function that lets us adjust the color of the tool to match the background in the color menu. At this stage of the workflow, we don't need to be too precise with the masking, but later on, a bit more accuracy will be helpful. To use the embeds, we now need to hit the refresh button and off we go. This is where the strength of IP adapter and its embeddings really shines. As mentioned, much of this could likely be achieved through prompting or other methods and nodes. However, the level of control it gives over individual image elements, unless they're too small, the ease of use with masks, and the fact that you can integrate them almost effortlessly into any stable diffusion workflow, even in animate diff, makes IP adapters one of my favorite tools in Comfy UI. To switch the scene around, you can simply swap the attention masks. And of course, you can go wild with as many IP adapter embeds as you like, as you can see. You have all the control options for frame design in the IP adapter embeds nodes as well. It's often worth trying them all out, but we're still missing a vertical frame.
I think that's enough variations for now. Stage four. Now onto the fourth and final stage of image preparation. This stage is all about creating the depth effect. We need to separate our subject from the background. Since there are multiple ways to do this, and each has its strengths and weaknesses depending on the image, I've included two of the methods I find most convincing. The first method uses the IceNet model, and the second uses SAM and grounding dyno. You can see the necessary nodes here. In between, there's another very useful node that helps maintain the correct proportions of the image subject, even when the resolution differs. Once that's done, it's time to give the subject a drop shadow. This adds more depth to the subject, which is crucial for stage five of the workflow, where we'll really bring the out-of-frame effect to life. To do this, we'll use a mask and the layer-style drop shadow node. To make the motif stand out from the background, we simply use a black image as the background image. The layer image is our Kraken and we now have to mask it. We can use the mask we created earlier for this. That's it, the Kraken can break the mold. Pun intended. The basic workflow remains as usual, and don't forget the perturbed attention guidance node. What's new here is the conditioning set mask node, which connects to the in-paint model conditioning node. The latter needs a load image node, and the load image as mask node connects to both inputs. For our drop shadow Kraken, we'll attach a control net through both positive and negative conditions. The Kraken's load image node runs through a depth map preprocessor. In addition, we need an IP adapter advanced, another load image node, and a load image as mask node, as well as the IP adapter unified loader. Now we have all the nodes in place. The main node we'll be working with is the load image as mask node, connected to the two conditioning nodes. After everything is connected and the appropriate settings are made, we can now place all the images and masks.
open the mask editor and mask the area where the kraken will appear. However, we need to align this with the kraken's position in the image. A little fine-tuning is needed, especially with the IP adapter advanced settings. But after a few adjustments, the Kraken does what it's supposed to and crawls menacingly through the frame towards us. As you can imagine, the whole process works similarly with the vertical frame. And of course, the embeds can once again be used to darken or brighten the mood, at least in the masked area. Whether the Kraken breaks through an image frame or a bathroom mirror, any breakthrough is possible. At the end of the image composition, you can, of course, let the base model take over the generation again with a high number of steps. You can also use an upscale model to bring the image to a higher resolution. That's it for this video. Have fun with the workflow. And if you found this video interesting and or helpful, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe. Last but not least, have a great day.